All right. So how do we start that off? Hola. Hola. Que paso? Yeah, peace. Shalom. How about howdy? Howdy. Howdy, y'all. How y'all doing? I like it. Bien? <laughs> so that's a multicultural phrase right there, right? Y'all? Bien? I like that. See. Si. All right. Good evening. Good to be with you. Always good to be with you guys. All right, so before we start tonight, I have been asked to announce to everybody that uh, Friday at 6.30, we're going to be having a, a little play that's going to be put on by our kids here at the church, and uh, it's a Good Friday play. Um, I'm pretty sure you know what the topic's going to be about, right? Anyway, I want to encourage you all to come out on Friday at 6.30 to watch it, support the kids, and it's going to actually be, from what I understand... Kind of an interactive kind of a thing, isn't that right? So those who are coming will actually have a, a participation role in it. So that's good. And uh, who said that? Echo, echo, echo. All right. You're making me crazy over there, Alon. All right. So let's pray, and we will jump into Second Samuel 18, guys. Ready? Heavenly Father. Thank you so much uh, for all the blessings you give to us, Lord, and uh, God, especially this week as we approach uh, Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday, Lord, we're, we're so mindful of your great love. We're so mindful of the great sacrifice you made for us. Lord, without you, Lord, we would have no hope. Lord, we wouldn't even know each other if it weren't for you. You've brought us into relationships and you've given us hope and purpose in our lives and we're just so thankful for you Jesus and above all that you rose from the dead and you've given us eternal life and uh, Lord we don't have to be afraid uh, Lord we can know tonight that you have all things well in hand and we're very thankful to know that so we just ask Lord tonight that you would bless us as we read your word together as we continue to look at David's life, may we, Lord, come away with those nuggets for our own lives as we study. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow, I was yawning there. Somebody flicked me with water or something, right? No, coffee. I'll just drink some coffee. Mm. So last week we did finish up chapter 17. And there was a couple of interesting things that took place. Uh, you might remember that the, uh, the fellas that had, had gone and hidden in, the, in the, the well of that lady's well, and she covered it up and put grain on it. And, of course, Absalom, was, his guys were looking for uh, Jonathan, and they, uh, they were unable to locate them there. Uh, we read about Ahithophel's council. And uh, so tonight, we are going to pick up our story. Um, one of the things we thought that was pretty interesting as we finished up last week was the, uh, the supplies that were brought uh, to, to David and his, his folks here, that, uh, all the amazing things that they brought from all the different areas down there in, in the land of Israel, in the, uh, in the land of Gilead. So let's pick it up in verse 1, chapter 18. It says that David numbered the people who were with him, and he set captains of thousands, captains of hundreds over them. And then David sent out one-third of the people under the hand of Joab, and one-third under the hand of Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, Joab's brother, and one-third under the hand of Ittai the Gittite. And the king said to the people, I also will surely go out with you myself. But the people answered, You shall not go out. For if we flee away, they will not care about us. Nor if half of us die, will they care about us. But you are worth 10,000 of us now. For you are now more help to us in the city. 
And the king said to them, Whatever seems best to you, I will do. So the king stood beside the gate, and all the people went out by hundreds and thousands. So last week we did mention that um, when David left Jerusalem, and you remember the guy that was throwing rocks and cursing him and all that stuff that was going on as they were leaving Jerusalem and, you know, descending down from, from, uh, from Jerusalem. And uh, you, really had, you really had no idea in your mind what a great number of people he had taken with him when he left. And so as we move into chapter 18, it gives us a really good picture Um, there were at least thousands of people. And that's pretty amazing that David still had that strong of a following after all the things that had been taking place in in Israel. And so David, he breaks the the armies up. He puts them under command of these guys. And, of course, you know David. He's a warrior. He's ready to strap on the sword and and go out and fight with them all. but things have changed a little bit, and uh, David's life is, is uh, very, very valuable. So, interesting to me how easily David accepts their counsel. There's no argument here. There's no saying, well, I'm the king, and I'm the warrior, and I need to go out. I'm the one that killed Goliath, after all. And, you know, I want to be on the battlefield with my people. Uh, which is always very admirable of a leader. Um, But uh, his uh, people give him good advice here. They're really not after us, David. They're after you. And basically, David, you're worth 10,000 of us. So your protection, your survival is the most important thing. So you're going to stay home. You're going to root for us when we go out, pray for us, whatever, and so the king said, okay. And I was kind of surprised when I saw that because there's no argument here. There's no uh, pride in the way. Uh, it would appear that as David was run out of town, he lost a lot of that arrogance and pride perhaps that he had before all these things took place. And so he stayed, and he stayed inside the gates where he would be safe. And uh, verse 5, it says, The king had commanded Joab and Abishai and Atai, saying, Deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. That's who they're heading out to do battle with. And all of the people heard it when the king gave all the captains orders concerning Absalom. So the people went out into the field of battle against Israel. And the battle was in the woods of Ephraim. So they're in this forested area now. And, and they're encountering the opposition out there doing warfare in the woods. Which is a totally different environment to do battle than on a plain or on an open field. And it tells us in verse 7 that the people of Israel were overthrown before the servants of David. And there was a great slaughter of 20,000 that took place there that day. And the battle was scattered over the face of the whole countryside. And the woods devoured more people that day than the sword devoured. So it's quite a picture to see these men doing battle, this great slaughter that took place, and this must have been a very, well, we know around here how thick a forest can be, how difficult it can be to to move around in in some of the, you know, like place where we live. Somebody once told me, um, if you live in eastern Oregon, you look through the forest. If you live in western Oregon, you look at the forest, right? And, And it's true. It's really a big difference. And so looking at our text here tonight, it would kind of give us the idea that this was a very thick forested area, very difficult to maneuver. Um, And it's interesting that it says that the woods 
devoured more people that day than the sword. And we're going to have an example of that exact thing here coming up. It says, Absalom met the servants of David. Absalom rode on a mule. And the mule went under the thick boughs of a great terebinth tree, and his head caught in the terebinth, so that he was left hanging between heaven and earth. And the mule, which was under him, went on. So Absalom, with his five pounds of hair, flowing in the wind, I suppose, as he's riding his little mule. How fast can a mule go, anyway? I mean, he's got little legs. He's just running through the forest, you know. How? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm thinking of a donkey. That's what I'm thinking of. Okay, now I get it. A mule. My neighbor's got mules. I should know better than that. Don't. They are fast, and they're big. All right, thank you for straightening me out there. So the mule leaves him hanging in the tree by his hair. <laughs> I don't know. That's just a picture that I've never been able to get over right there. And so there was a certain man who saw it, and he told Joab, <laughs> I just saw Absalom hanging in the terebinth tree. And Joab said to the man who told him, you just saw him? Why did you not strike him there to the ground? I would have given you ten shekels of silver and a belt. Doesn't sound like much of a reward, but... But the man said to Joab, Though I received a thousand shekels of silver in my hand, I would not raise my hand against the king's son. For in our hearing the king commanded you and Abishai and Ittai, saying, Beware lest anyone touch the young man, Absalom. He wanted protection for the young man, Absalom. Otherwise, I would have dealt falsely against my own life. I would have put my own life at risk for killing Absalom, for there is nothing hidden from the king, and you yourself would have set yourself against me. So Joab said, I cannot linger with you, and he took three spears in his hand, and he thrust them through Absalom's heart while he was still alive in the midst of the terebinth tree. Ten young men who bore Joab's armor surrounded Absalom, and that sound of angels playing music in the sky was heard throughout the... No, no, that's somebody's cell phone going off. Okay. Ah. It was perfect. It fit perfect, didn't it? <coughs> so there were ten young men who bore Joab's armor, surrounded Absalom, and struck and killed him. Boy, what a way to go. You know, this guy, Absalom, we learned a lot about him. We saw how conniving he was and deceiving he was and uh, how he did not have David's best interest at heart. And he kind of reminded us of a lot of, actually, of the devil in the way he was behaving, um, conspiring against the kingdom, if you will. And uh, Joab here, he doesn't have any problem. How do you hold three, how do you hold three spears in one hand? You must have a pretty big hand or something, right? Someone's saying they're very small spears. Maybe kind of like an arrow, or maybe a little bit bigger than an arrow, right? Not toothpicks. <coughs> so, as he's hanging in the tree, by his hair, unfortunately, he gets killed in a hard, difficult manner. Ten men struck him after he already had three spears in his heart. So Joab blew the trumpet and the people returned from pursuing Israel. For Joab held back the people. And they took Absalom and they cast him into a large pit 
in the woods. And they laid a very large heap of stones over him. And then all of Israel fled, everyone to his tent. Now, Absalom in his lifetime had taken and set up a pillar for himself. That tells you a lot about Absalom. He set up a pillar for himself, which is in the king's valley. For he said, I have no son to keep my name in remembrance. So he called the pillar after his own name. So unto this day it is called Absalom's Monument. That kind of sums up his life, doesn't it? You know, he, he really had ambitious plans. He really, he really did think that he was going to overthrow his father and uh, take over the kingdom. But you know, it's amazing to me when we look at a story like this because sometimes in our goings to and fro in our lives, you know, uh, God has maybe laid a path out for you, uh, a ministry for you, uh, a destiny for you. And you all know that there's a lot of times when you come into conflict where there are either people or circumstances or things beyond your control sometimes that, that uh, would like to stifle your mission, so to speak. Put an end to your mission, and that was Absalom's goal, was to put an end to his father. And, but there's one thing I think that Absalom didn't realize, and, and neither do folks today realize. When God puts a calling on your life, nothing can stop it. Well, actually, I should rephrase that. There is something that can stop it. You. Right? We can say no. God is sovereign. You know, the Bible says that the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. And I love that. It's encouraging to hear that because it lets us know that, you know, we might not be all of that. We might not be so perfect or refined or educated or whatever, but yet God puts a calling on your life. And maybe you stumble a little bit. Maybe you get out there in the world and you fall on your face. Maybe you backslide. Maybe you walk away from God. Does that mean that the calling he's put on your life is null and void? No, it does not. Does that mean that it's his will that eventually you would come around to fulfill the calling that he's put on your life? Absolutely. He doesn't put a calling on our lives and then go, Ah, you've really disappointed me. You didn't live up to it, so you're fired. Right? The gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. It's encouraging because no matter what you come up against, whatever that uh, Absalom might be in your life, the gifts and the callings of God are still sure. They will come to fruition. Um, how many times perhaps did David um, doubt the anointing that God had put on him to be the king, to be the line that the, the, the Messiah would come through uh, down, way down the road, generations uh, after him. To feel unworthy, to feel broken, to feel like I have let God down and I guess I'll just settle for, I don't know, being a farmer or a shepherd out in a field somewhere. And God's saying, no. I have a calling on your life. I have a purpose for you. So you're broken. You failed. You know you failed. And now you're, you're humble. Some of that pride, some of that glow that you, you had about yourself is, is gone. But it doesn't mean that I still don't have a purpose for you. Um, a lot of people see that actually lived out in their lives where... They blow it, and then they figure, that's it. It's over for me. But I got to tell you, it's not over. If God's really got that call on your life, and you surrender your heart back to him again, then he will deal with Absalom. He will take care of that, and he will put it in a place where you'll be able to be restored to what God has called you to do. 
Um, I say that not out of head knowledge, but out of life experience. Uh, and a lot of you have experienced that too in your lives. So you know exactly uh, what I'm talking about. So Absalom has been dealt with, and not in a very glorious manner. I don't know how much more humiliating it could have got for him in the way he was taken out. Um, quite sad, actually. The man must have been a very gifted person. Um, when you look at the effect that he had on the population of Israel, he turned the whole country against his father. He must have been a smooth talker. He must have really known how to, to deal with people. Um, but yet, um, he tried to touch the Lord's anointed. And it didn't work out too well for him. So verse 19 says, Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok, said, Let me run now and take the news to the king, how the Lord has avenged him of his enemies. So this was the email of the day. This is how they communicated. They had runners. And they would send messages. And these guys were professional runners. They could run all day. You know, that was their job, to carry, carry the news. Let me go to the king real quick. And Joab said, no, you shall not take the news this day. You shall take the news another day. But today you shall take no news, because the king's son is dead. Joab is the one that extinguished him, dispatched him, however you want to put it. But yet he has enough respect for David. He has enough understanding about how David really felt about Absalom that it's got to take a step back here and take a breath, take a moment for what has just transpired because this is a great tragedy. It's a very sad thing. I remember something that happened when I was a little boy and I'll never ever forget it. And it was when President Kennedy was shot. I bet you guys that were around remember exactly where you were the moment that happened. It's amazing how events can happen in history and have such a profound impact on us that that we remember the very moment. And I think that I think that for, 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 for Joab here, he's, he's showing that kind of respect. He's saying, this isn't just another guy that's been killed in the forest. This is a big deal here. Absalom, you know, he had the heart of his father David. And we're going to see that um, David's heart still fell after Absalom. It still longed. For Absalom to be an ally in his life, a support in his life. And it never, ever, it never, ever came to fruition. But this was bad news. This was a day to sit back and reflect. We'll tell the king at another day. And so Joab said to the Cushite, Go and tell the king what you've seen. And so the Cushite bowed himself to Joab and ran. And Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok, said again to Joab, But whatever happens, please let me run also after the Cushite. And so Joab said, Well, why will you run, my son, since you have no news ready? But whatever happens, he said, Let me run. <laughs> okay, he said, Run. So Ahimaaz ran by way of the plain, and he outran the Cushite. So David is sitting between the two gates, and the watchman went up to the roof over the gate, to the wall, and he lifted his eyes, and he looked. And there was a man running alone. And the watchman cried out, and he told the king. And the king said, If he's alone... Then there's news in his mouth. And he came rapidly and drew near. And then the watchman saw another man running. 
The watchman called to the gatekeeper and said, There's another man running alone. The king said, He also brings news. And so the watchman said, I think he's running of the first is like the running of a Himaaz. This dude must have had a, a very uh, noticeable gait or something when he ran, right? Like a gazelle or whatever, but he recognized him in the distance. That's uh, a Himaaz there. I can tell by the way he's running. Uh, that's the son of Zadok, and he's a good man. He must be coming with good news. And so Ahimaaz called out and he said to the king, All is well. And he bowed himself down with his face to the earth before the king. He said, Blessed be the Lord your God, who has delivered up the men who raised their hand against my lord the king. So you notice he's not mentioning Absalom. He's just saying, your warriors did great. They, they've been delivered, uh, all those who rose up against you. And of course, David, he only has one thing on his mind. How's my boy? How's that little rebel boy out there that I love so much who has betrayed me so many times? It just blows me away. I, I don't really... I can't really um, put my finger on this after everything that Absalom has done. Perhaps David hoped to the end uh, that Absalom would come around. But the first thing he says, it's not how are my uh, warriors doing or how are my generals, how's Joab, you know, what happened on the belt. None of that is, is, is even comes into David's mind. The first thing out of his mouth is, is the young man Absalom safe? Him as answered. When Joab sent the king's servant and me to your servant, I saw a great tumult, but I did not know what it was about. He doesn't want to tell David. He doesn't want to mention it. And the king said, Then turn aside and stand over here. And so he turned aside and he stood still. Just then the Cushite came and the Cushite said, There's good news, my lord the king. <laughs> For the Lord has avenged you this day of all of those who rose against you. Yeah, kind of sounds like a repeat. You think they're in competition with each other or something here maybe going on or what? I'd like to be there first to tell the king, to do, you know, about the victory. And boy, this dude outran the other guy. And it's like a little race going on here. The Lord has avenged you this day of all those who rose against you. And here we go. The king says to the Cushite, is the young man Absalom safe? So the Cushite answered, may the enemies of my lord the king and all who rise against you to do harm be like that young man. And then the king was deeply moved. He went up to the chamber over the gate and he wept. And as he went, he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died in your place. Oh, my son, my son. A tragic day for David. Perhaps his, he was deeply moved by this. Perhaps his emotions are misplaced. Perhaps he had hoped so much that he and his son would be able to reconcile. And then they went to Joab and they told him, they said, the king is weeping and mourning for Absalom. And so the victory that day was turned into mourning for all the people. For the people heard it said that day that the king is grieved for his son. And the people stole back into the city that day as people were ashamed steal away when they flee in battle. 
But the king covered his face, and the king cried out with a loud voice, O oh, my son Absalom, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Joab was a very wise man. He's a, not just a great commander on the battlefield, but a, a good advisor. Joab comes to the house of the king. He says, Today you have disgraced all your servants who today have saved your life and the lives of your sons and your daughters, the lives of your wives and the lives of your concubines in that you love your enemies and you hate your friends. For you have declared today that you regard neither princes nor servants. For today I perceive that if Absalom had lived and, <clears throat> and all of us had died today, then it would have pleased you well. Now therefore arise and go out and speak comfort to your servants. For I swear by the Lord, if you do not go out, no one will stay with you this night. And that will be worse for you than all of the evil that has befallen you from your youth until now. Joab's got a good point, doesn't he? Yeah, that's one thing to mourn over your son, but he... Do you think that he would be mourning over you, David, if he had slain you? No. He would have been rejoicing. Do you think that, that uh, if all of us had died today and Absalom lived, evidently you'd be happy. So you better get your head on straight. You better get your priorities right. You better understand that these people have basically laid down their life for you. They sold out for you. And now you're pretty much abandoning them. And so the king arose and he sat in the gate. And they told all the people saying, there's the king sitting in the gate. So all the people came before the king, and every one of Israel had fled to his tent. So we got two groups here now, remember? We got those of, quote, Israel, who were Absalom's allies to overthrow David. And then we have all the people who were with David on the battlefield. So we have two different groups here. And we know from studying David's life that uh, he went through a lot of really bad times, didn't he? A lot of defeats, a lot of mistakes, a lot of foolish, stupid choices that he made in his life. But he's being told here, you know what, you think that was bad? This is going to be worse if you don't do something about it. And so all the people were in a dispute throughout the tribes of Israel, saying, The king saved us from the hand of our enemies. He delivered us from the hand of the Philistines. And now he has fled from the land because of Absalom. But Absalom, whom we anointed over us, has died in battle. Now, therefore, why do you say nothing about bringing back the king? So King David sent to Zadok and Abathar the priest, saying, Speak to the elders of Judah, saying, Why are you the last to bring the king back to his house? Since the words of all of Israel have come to the king to this very house. You are my brethren. You are my bone and my flesh. Why then are you the last to bring back the king? And say to Amasa, are you not my bone and my flesh? God do so to me and more also, if you are not commander of the army before me continually in the place of Joab. So he swayed the hearts of all the men of Judah, just as the heart of one man. So they sent this word to the king, return you and all of your servants. So the people of Israel now have determined that they want David back. 
since his son has been killed, they want him to return. They want him to reestablish his throne. And so the king returned and he came to the Jordan. And Judah came to Gilgal to meet the king, to escort the king across the Jordan. And Shimei, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, who was from Baruim, he hurried and he came down with the men of Judah to meet King David. So this guy Shimei here, the son of Gera, was a Benjamite. So who else do we know was a Benjamite? It was Saul. And his kids and his family who continually were trying to assume the throne in David's place. And we saw this one and only son that survived, the cripple, who technically should have been uh, Saul's successor. But these men came down from Judah, these Benjamite, and these men came down to meet King David. It says that there were a thousand of them. There were a thousand men from Benjamin with him. And Ziba, the servant of the house of Saul, and his 15 sons and his 20 servants with him. And they went over the Jordan before the king. And then a ferry boat went across to carry over the king's household and to do what he thought good. So Shimei, the son of Gera, fell down before the king when he had crossed Jordan. And he said to the king, Do not let the Lord impute iniquity to me or remember what wrong your servant did on the day that my lord the king left Jerusalem, that the king should take it to heart. <laughs> For I, your servant, know that I have sinned. Therefore, here I am, the first to come today of all the house of Joseph, to go down to meet my lord the king. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, answered, and he said, Shall not Shimei be put to death for this, because he cursed the Lord's anointed? And David said, What have I to do with you? You sons of Zeruiah, that you should be adversaries to me today. Shall any man be put to death today in Israel? I do not know that today, for do I not know that today I am king over Israel? Therefore the king said to Shimei, you shall not die. And the king swore to him. So this guy was kind of a traitor. He stood against David. He rooted, he rooted for Saul's household. Not so much for David's son, but for his own bloodline to take over the throne, which they were never able to do. But this man comes and he confesses. I was wrong. And he did deserve death. Truly, he did. But I think something has happened to David. It seems as though he's a little bit different. It seems as though he's changed a little bit. It seems like he has a heart of mercy. And I think that David is looking at this saying, you know what, there's been enough death, there's been enough bloodshed, there's been enough killing. It needs to come to an end. It's over. And so the king said, you're not going to die. Now, Mephibosheth, remember, he's the crippled boy. He's the one that got dropped on the ground by the nurse when they were fleeing the palace. And Mephibosheth became a cripple, broke his back or whatever it was that he could not walk so he came down to meet the king and he had not cared for his feet nor trimmed his mustache 
or washed his clothes from the day the king departed until the day he returned in peace. Oh, man, I don't know how long that was, but that's pretty stinky. And there's nothing worse than looking at a guy's old dirty feet, especially when you don't trim your toenails or your mustache. All you guys with mustaches, take heed. Or washed his clothes. My goodness. Probably a pretty scary looking guy. And so it was when he came back to Jerusalem to meet the king that the king said, Why did you not go with me, Mephibosheth? He answered, oh, My lord, O king, my servant deceived me. For your servant said, I will saddle a donkey for myself that I may ride on it and go to the king, because your servant is lame. And he has slandered your servant to my lord the king. But my lord the king is like the angel of God. Therefore do what is good in your eyes. David wants to know, Mephibosheth, why, why didn't you come with me? Why have you been in seclusion all this time? <laughs> I really had no way to get to you, Dave. I can't walk. You know, the servants deceived me. And uh, I tried to get to you, but I couldn't. And, you know, he slant, you've been slandered. Um, but he says, I know, David, you have a good heart. So you do what you think is right. He says, because everyone in my father's house were dead men before my lord the king. Yet you sent your servant among those who eat at your own table. Therefore, what right have I still to cry out any more to the king? So do you remember the promise that David made to this guy? It's chapters earlier. Before the rebellion, before all this stuff was going on, when he first took the throne and he found Mephibosheth and he made a promise to him because he was the only survivor of Saul's family who was in line for the throne. So he made a commitment to Mephibosheth out of respect to Saul. And all these years have gone by. And the king says to him in verse 29, Why do you speak any more of your matters? I have said you and Ziba divide the land. And then Mephibosheth said to the king, Rather let him take it all, inasmuch as my lord the king has come back in peace to his own house. Mephibosheth was not interested in his inheritance, he wasn't interested in Saul's property or his land. He just wanted to be there with the king. He just wanted to hang out with David. So Barzillai, that's a great name, uh, the Gileadite, came down from Rogalim, and he went across the Jordan with the king to escort him across the Jordan. Now, Barzillai was a very aged man. He was 80 years old. And he had provided the king with supplies while he stayed at Mananaim, for he was a very rich man. So the king says to Barzillai, come across with me, and I will provide for you while you are with me in Jerusalem. But Brazilia, I said to the king, How long have I to live that I should go up with the king to Jerusalem? I am today 80 years old. Can I discern between good and bad? Can your servant taste what I eat or what I drink? 
Can I hear any longer the voice of singing men and women? Why then should your servant be a further burden to my lord the king? Your servant will go a little way across Jordan with the king. And why should the king repay me with such a reward? This is quite an awesome guy here. He said, please let your servant turn back again that I may die in my own city, near the grave of my father and mother. But here is your servant, Chimam. Let him cross over with my lord the king and do for him what seems good to you. And the king answered, Jimaham shall cross over with me, and I will do for him what seems good to you. So whatever you request of me, I will do for you. And then all the people went over the Jordan. And when the king had crossed over, the king kissed Barzillai and blessed him. And he returned to his own place. A great ally that David had, a, a man who provided for him when he was in big trouble, so to speak. This man realizes, <laughs> now 80's not that old, is it? It doesn't seem like it's that old tonight, does it? Um, it's not too far off out there for some of us. But you can still hear, right? You can still taste your food, right? You can still enjoy music. This guy's like pretty much just saying, dude, I'm all used up. Just let me go home and die. Right? What, what good could I be to you? I'm just going to be a bummer. You're going to have to put me in a nursing home and feed me and change my diaper. and Just let me go home and die in my father's house. Right? But he says, I have this great guy. He's been taking care of me all these years. His name is Chimam. He can go with you. And so David took him. They crossed over the Jordan. He told Belzelai goodbye, blessed him, and the old man went home. Now the king went on to Gilgal, and Chimaham went on with him. And all the people of Judah escorted the king, and also half of the people of Israel. So they're starting to reunify again here. David is getting reestablished as the king over Israel and Judah. So in verse 41 it said, Just then all the men of Israel came to the king, and they said to the king, Why have our brethren, the men of Judah, stolen you away and brought the king, his household, and all of David's men with him across the Jordan. So all the men of Judah answered the men of Israel, because the king is a close relative of ours. So why are you angry over this matter? Have we ever eaten at the king's expense, or has he given us any gifts? And the men of Israel answered the men of Judah and said, We have ten shares in the king. Therefore, we have more rights to David than you. So why then do you despise us? Were we not the first to advise bringing back our king? Yet the words of the men of Judah were fiercer than the words of the men of Israel. So already here we're seeing uh, we're seeing the kingdom splitting we're seeing a problem here because you might remember when david was anointed the king it wasn't just over israel it was over judah and israel it was one large kingdom that he ruled over now we're beginning to see these disputes these uh, internal arguments going on within the country itself, as to who has more rights to David, you or us? And 
this is going to continue to um, it's going to continue to simmer, if you will, until it reaches a boiling point, and the people of Judah and the people of Israel will separate. They'll become two kingdoms. That's when things get really, really weird when you're trying to study the Old Testament because you have to be real careful as you're going down through there to know this king that we're talking about here, is he a Judah king or an Israel king? Because they both have two different countries. They both have two different um, things going on at the same time. And we're going to see that come to pass here pretty soon when the, when the nation is broken in two. So I'm going to stop right there tonight. I think that's a, a good place to park for the night. David is back in Jerusalem. He's back to being restored as the king. And, uh, but all things are not right. There's still a lot of problems. Still a lot of... Um, well, we see it in politics today. There's a lot of agendas going on. And uh, a lot of people that want absolute power, absolutely, right? So that struggle will continue. But, uh, you know, it's amazing when you look at these uh, stories, especially in First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings. Um, and the Chronicles, um, of all the dynamics that are interworking in this whole thing. Now, you might look at it from 30 feet and go, what a mess, you know. These are God's people. I mean, they've avenged their enemies. They've, you know, they've established themselves in the, in the, in the land. They've defeated the, all the ites, the parasites and the you know, Canaanites and all of those ites out there running around. They, they've had victory over them. They're in the land. They, they were truly one nation under one king. And they're going to, even after all that's happened, there's still not going to be peace. There's still going to be uh, strife. And uh, it's sad to see the, the human element here. Um, you would think, man, you know, we got it made. We got everything we ever hoped for. We came in the land. We, we had victory over our enemies. Uh, God has preserved the king. Uh, we're back in Jerusalem again. We're, everything seems to be doing okay, but we're not going to be happy with that. You know, we're going to be discontented. You know, here we are. We live in a country where you can say what you want and you can be free and you can do all these great things and it's been established on good morals and ethics and biblical principles. And boy, you know, how could things ever get any better than living in the United States of America? Well, it doesn't seem like we can get along very well either. Kind of seems like we're kind of split down the middle, too. It's all that human factor that gets in the way, isn't it? My agenda, your agenda, you know. Uh, who says we have to, you know, live by your rules? And uh, who says that there's a God that makes the rules in the first place? Maybe there, Maybe we should make our own rules. How does that work out? Not very good. We'll see it happen here. We're seeing it happen around us right now. And uh, so I'll leave us with this. Pray for our country. Pray for our leaders. You know, I can't say either way what's going to happen. In my heart, I would like to say we're going to get it figured out, you guys. It's going to be okay. But then, I don't know.
Maybe it won't. Maybe as we move closer and closer to that day when the Lord calls us home, maybe things will become rougher. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll never realize the American dream ever, ever again. I don't know. But I know one thing. I trust the Lord. I trust that he is just. He has everything under control. He's a merciful God. It's not his will that any should perish, although they will. And it must grieve his heart to look at a nation like ours and see the depravity and the things that are going on in it today. You know, he lost patience with Israel. He sent them into captivity. He destroyed, he allowed their nation to be destroyed. They became so corrupt and so filthy and, and so sinful as time went on that he lifted his hand off of them. Um, prepare yourself. Let me just say it like that. Let's be prepared. So, let's pray. Father, uh, Lord, I know that History does seem to re- repeat itself sometimes. And uh, as we see the inner workings of what's going on with Judah and Israel and power plays and selfishness and all the things, Lord, the, the, all the seeds of corruption that are being planted uh, in our stories right now as we move forward in the Bible, Lord, it, it, it's almost a mirror image of what we're going through. It almost seems like we're experiencing the same thing in our country and in our lives. And I know, Lord, that we here in this place, in this moment, we are quite far removed from all the ugliness that's going on out there. But we know it's just down the road, just a couple of cities away, and it's like Sodom and Gomorrah. And I just want to pray, God, tonight that you would give us courage that you would give us peace, that you would give us a great trust in you this evening because we do not pretend to know how things are going to truly unfold. We have our ideas, we have our hopes, we have our dreams. But I think most of all and above all, Lord, we want your will to be done. And I would just pray, Lord, that through your Holy Spirit, that you would strengthen us and anoint this church and our people. Lord, that you would bring a movement to Sheridan, that you would bring a revival to this place. As we look around in our little community, we see so many that are lost, so many that have no hope, so many that don't have a clue. And I just pray that we could be the light, that we could be the ones that might bring peace into their lives too. Thank you, Lord, that you never give up on us. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy. As we leave here tonight, Lord, refresh us. As we quickly approach Friday, Lord, may we be ever mindful of what you did for us 2,000 years ago. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.